Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over a 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Handle with Care, Cancer and Beyond is a podcast that gives everyone and anyone a place to come and keep it real about their cancer experience. Welcome to Handle With Care, Cancer and Beyond. Hey everyone, we are here and we are back with another episode of Handle With Care, Cancer and Beyond. My name is Chris Donovan, the producer and co-host here, along with Carrie Madrid of the thecareprojectinc.org. Now in this conversation, Carrie and I get to speak with a mindfulness coach, author, and breast cancer survivor, Sharon Brock. We chat about Sharon's new book, The Lovey Method, Five Mindfulness Practices for the Journey of Breast Cancer. It's part memoir, part mindfulness teaching, but also I think it can help more than just people going through breast cancer. I think it can help people going through anxiety. I think it can help people going through other hard times in their life. It's called The Lovey Method. So listen up to this conversation with Carrie, myself, Sharon Brock, and uh, visit SharonBrockMindfulness.com while you listen. Enjoy. Welcome back to another edition of Handle with Care. Hey, Chris. Hi, Carrie. How are you? I'm great. Glad to have you back. Yeah, I know. It's awesome seeing those lights glow on behind you. I know, right? They look I really know. cool. I know. You did a good job on my studio. I appreciate Thanks. you. Thanks. If you want to I... build a studio, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we are joined today by breast cancer survivor and author Sharon Brock. Hey, Sharon. Hi, how are you? Really great. I'd be better if I was with you in Hawaii right now. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So Sharon, I'm going to give a little bit of background on Sharon. Sharon Brock is a breast cancer survivor and a certified mindfulness facilitator trained at the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center. She's also a health and wellness journalist with a master's degree from Columbia University. Sharon teaches mindfulness courses online at corporations and studios and with private clients as a mindfulness coach. You currently are in Maui, but you're based out of Los Angeles, right? That's correct. Fantastic. Yep. She's got a brand new book out called The Lovey Method, Five Mindfulness Practices for the Journey of Breast Cancer. So we have a lot to talk about with you. <laughs> Where do we want to start? You were diagnosed in 2019? 2018. Oh, 18. Okay. So how did April that come about? Oh, we never forget the date, right? Oh, oh, and the hour. It was 10, 15 in the morning. Yeah. When, oh, yeah. How did you discover your breast cancer? Was it on routine mammogram or you found it yourself or? Well, the interesting thing is, is that I was only 44 and I had yet to get a mammogram. Mm -hmm. And just luckily my gynecologist found the lump. And so it was, it was really just serendipity, just good luck because I had the fastest growing type of breast cancer called HER2. There are four different types mm -hmm. and I had the fastest growing. So thank God I caught it, you know, early stages, stage two is what okay. I ended up being. Yeah. So it was really, um, I was really lucky, honestly. I mean, I really think people, women need to, to give themselves the breast um, to search for the lumps themselves because I, I was lucky. Yeah. And I will interject there and say men as well. So we, men are, too, sure. yeah, absolutely. So we know it's one in eight women right now and one in 833 men. Those are for, that's for the U.S. will be diagnosed in their lifetime. So early yeah. detection is key. We hear the phrase all the time. It's, you know, I think a lot of us become desensitized to that phrase, but it is crucial knowing you're normal. You're in the shower anyway, check your chest, check your breasts. We all have breast tissue, right? So I was 41 right when I got my diagnosis. So I hadn't had a mammogram yet either. So mm -hmm. my very first mammogram was to confirm my breast cancer diagnosis. 
How did you process when you, when you heard the news? Like, what was your initial reaction? Were you shocked? Were you kind of suspecting it or? Oh, I was completely shocked and completely in denial. And this is kind of the first chapter one of my book is, is really all about how I was a health and wellness journalist, you know, a yoga and mindfulness practitioner and teacher. And it wasn't going to happen to me. Of course not. I was young. It was not in my family. Yeah. complete, you know, I wrote articles on how to prevent cancer. I mean, it obviously it was never going to happen to me. And I was just one of those anomalies that unfortunately is not that rare. And um, so even when I found the lumps, I was like, oh, it's just fibroids or I'm sure it's okay. I was completely in denial. And so when I, when I received that phone call, I, I went into a state of shock that I had never experienced before. I mean, kind of similar to like a car accident. I think people can relate to that where you kind of like go out of your body for a little bit. Um, that was me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like my, it's like my consciousness went out of my body from like sea level to 3000 feet, you know, yeah. and like, kind of looking down at myself, it was, it was a very interesting experience. And then essentially that was probably the peak of my anxiety. And then as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And so because my anxiety was so high and I was a mindfulness practitioner, I was just practicing, practicing, doing my meditations for hours a day, trying to, for my own, just really to calm my own anxiety, trying to find tools and that's how the lovey method was born. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not awesome, the diagnosis, but yeah, I mean, the fact yeah. that, you know, I, I want to go back to something you said about how, uh, you know, like in theory, right. It wasn't supposed to happen to you, right. Because you were this okay. health uh, professional and mindfulness professional, and you spoke about prevention, but I think it's important. And it's like, for Chris and I, it's like beating a dead horse. We say it time and time again, no one is exempt. That's right. No yeah. one is exempt. It doesn't matter if it runs in your family or not. I gave you the statistics. One in eight women, one in 833 men. Mm -hmm. Over 80% of all breast cancer cases are not genetic. So, yeah. it, you, you know, it's sort of, you know, it sounds cliche, but it's true. It's not why me, it's why not me. That's right. So, all we can do is try our best, which is what you did to prevent it. And then if you are given the diagnosis, use all the tools possible, right? Yeah. Which is one of the things we want to talk about, right? Is using all the tools possible to manage it and get through it and then move forward after, right? And that looks different for everybody. Absolutely. It does look yeah. different for everybody. And with my book, I'm essentially just offering one possible path through this journey. Yeah. Right. How important. It's, yeah. Coping skills, you mm -hmm. know, specific mindfulness tools that are research backed, you know, a lot, all of these practices, L-O-V-E-E -E, are five different practices and they've all been, you know, backed by neuroscience research primarily at UCLA. Okay. Yeah. I want to get to that in a minute, but tell us what treatment did you have? Did you have surgery, chemo, radiation? What was your deal? Sure. Um, <clears throat> So I had stage two, HER2 breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the hormone type, like the progesterone and estrogen mm -hmm. type, HER2. So for my chemo, I received a medicine called Herceptin, which mm -hmm. is essentially specific for HER2. And I received chemo every three weeks for a year. So 17 treatments um, in total, mm -hmm. a year to the day, which is, ex which is wild. Yeah, that's and, crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, for every every um, patient, the treatment is different. It's tailored yeah. to them. For me personally, I received five, like, <laughs> the big guns is what my oncologist called it. We're going to give you the big guns. For the I think they're given like a little um, key of what phrases to use, because that's exactly yeah. what they told me. Well, they're going to come at you with the, my nurse uh, navigator said, they're going to come yeah. in with the big guns blaze. And I was like, what does that even mean? I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because uh, I talk about this a bit in my book, how language actually matters mm -hmm. because I never say I'm battling cancer. I'm just for me, this is what some, for some people that really works. 
Um, but just really know what works for you. And for me, it was actually like, I'm dancing with cancer. I'm working with it. I'm grateful for the chemo. I would give my cells like a pep talk before every infusion, like, it's okay. You're going to get a visitor today and it's, they're going to feel weird, but welcome them in. They're here to help, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like establishing a sense of gratitude in the body. It's mindset. That really allowed. Yeah. So I have audio meditations, you know, in the book, as well as on my website for That's people fantastic. to listen to while they're getting infusions. I wish I had all the information I have now that I'm eight and at night nine and a half years out. I, I wish I knew back then what I know now, because man, my experience, I call it my cancer extravaganza. Yeah. My cancer extravaganza was, um, like you said, I made every chemo treatment, like an event, uh, whether that was a crazy fedora, whether that was like, I always, <laughs> and my motto was laughter and lip gloss. So, you know, I did what I had to do to get through. And okay. what you touched on was the battle language. And we've talked about that before on the show, huh, Chris, with Amy yeah. Hartle of As We Are Now. And she's really, um, um, she really does not like the battle language because it's that whole win or lose. They lost their battle. No, they didn't lose yeah. their battle. And that's a whole other show. But but this is why when, when you got in touch with me, I really wanted to touch on, we have so many topics we could talk on with you, talk on, yeah. geez, explore with you. Um, but I love the fact of, you know, my favorite quote I was sharing with Chris, my favorite quote is um, one that you mentioned, which is pain is inevitable, misery, <clears throat> excuse me, misery or suffering is, is optional, right? Right. Um, and that comes down to the mindset and the perspective. And we don't, I'll have that in that moment when we're making decisions for our treatment or starting our treatment like chemo or radiation or getting ready to undergo surgery. So this is, I'm so grateful that you're here and I can't wait to order your book because I want to have it here in our library for others. Um, but so you had chemo, did you have surgery or radiation as well? I did. So I had yeah. surgery. Remember my chemo treatments were one year. I basically mm -hmm. had surgery at the six month mark. Okay. And then I, I was supposed to have radiation after that, but I, it wasn't necessary. Fantastic. But this is a, like spoiler alert for the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. Okay. Oh. Beep all that out. It'll be like, it'll just be a minute of a beeping right there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, then let's fast forward to the book. Let's fast forward a little bit more to uh, well, you know, a little bit more sure. about the book. Why did you write it? When did you write it? So as I said, I was diagnosed April thirtieth, two thousand eighteen, mm -hmm. and. For the first couple of weeks, I was just in shock. I had to kind of come to terms with this reality. Um, but then I realized, okay, I'm a health and wellness. I'm a medical journalist. I am a mindfulness facilitator and practitioner. So I have these skills of writing as well as, you know, wellness practical tools. And I just thought, this is my duty. I, I have to write this book because there are 300 thousand u.s well women i don't know what the right for men is but you know three hundred thousand u.s women are diagnosed with this every year mm -hmm. you know it, how could i not share these tools it, so i started pretty early on just a couple two three weeks after diagnosis i just decided you know i'm going to turn my pain into purpose let's do this yeah and i just started writing scenes you know just the scene like what happened first chemo what was that like my first panic attack, what was that like? Just, just writing it. Like when I got the port inserted, that was a huge um, monumentous part of this journey because it was a, a physical representation of I have cancer because previous to that, it was just a concept in my mind, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I could kind of feel the lumps, but the port, as you know. Was it like makes it spot. real. It's like, yeah. oh shoot, here we go, right? Here we go. Yeah. And when you started writing all this, did you know it was going to be a book or were you just trying to get everything down before you forgot? Like, did you have a vision? I did. I did have the vision for the book. Yeah. Okay. And I, I didn't know it was going to call, be called the Lovey Method at the beginning um, because Lovey came to me like three months in, I would say, because I was writing scenes because, you know, because then when you're writing the scenes in the moment, like the day that it happens, your emotion is also in those words. So it feels more authentic. And that's really my, my goal with this book is to connect at that emotional level with, 
with the readers, you know, you know, so that the women who are reading it think, gosh, I'm not alone. Like she, she feels me like she knows she put what I'm feeling into words. It's really and important. I, it's that's yeah. really, really important. I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just thinking about when, you know, one of the things, um, one of the questions we get asked a lot at the care project, when people are diagnosed, there are oftentimes their loved ones will call the office and say, you know, my sister was just diagnosed or whoever was just diagnosed. And what can I get them? What's the best thing to do? And I'm like, whatever you do, don't, don't just go buy everything pink, right? Like, first of all, <laughs> well, that's just me. I hate pink. <laughs> I'm surprised. Hold on. I'm surprised your first answer wasn't tequila. Right? <laughs> but okay, I was- tequila works too. <laughs> um, I was inundated with books. Okay. Yeah. I was inundated not with- pink. Did you notice? Not pink. Right. I appreciate that. But you <laughs> know what? the thing is like, I was inundated with books and a lot of them were big, huge novels and they were people's stories and it was scary stuff and right. and while the intention was fantastic it wasn't practical it wasn't practical in that moment because as you know when you're in chemo there is no way you're reading a big old novel you're not you can't focus your eyes are watering from the drugs like well that was just me <laughs> but I mean it's like it's too much but one book was given to me that I did read and the reason I read it in that moment is because it was very small it was, uh, it had like a, the cover looked like a comic book. And I thought, okay, this is going to be a little bit lighthearted, or at least so there'll be some humor in there. And that's how I used to cope with my laughter and lip gloss. And it was called the courage muscle. And it was also written by a stage three breast cancer patient, which was important to me because I was stage three and all the other books I read were pre vivers or stage one or stage two, not minimizing the fact that they heard the words you have breast cancer, but I needed to hear from someone who heard they had stage three. Yeah, I read that book. Yeah. And I read the book. And and what made me think about it is what you just said. As I was reading it, I was like, Oh, my gosh, she gets me like I know her. Is she my cousin? Like, I felt like I was in her living room. I laughed. I mean, I howled. I laughed. I cried. I clapped. I was like, Oh, my God, I got to meet her. (laughs) <laughs> and I Googled her and apparently she passed away 10 years later. So that has never left me because I'm approaching 10 years, but it was a fantastic read. And so I think it's really important that your, your intention with writing the book was to be that companion, very much like our book um, yeah. that yeah. we have at the care project called handle with care. So tell us what lovey stands for. What are those yeah. five mindfulness practices? I will. Thank you. And I, and I want to, um, kind of add to what you just said, because my intention with the memoir chapters is to connect at that heart level. And so women feel understood, but then the practice chapters. So that's how it's, that's okay. how the book is structured. It's I like that two parts, memoir, one chapter practice. So the third chapter is, is L for label. Okay. And I kind of switch hats from cancer patient to mindfulness teacher. And I, I teach the loving method. I teach, you know, the label practice in chapter three and the neuroscience that backs it up. And then at the end of chapter three, I have a script of an actual label practice meditation. And then you can go to my website to hear the label practice as an audio. I love that. Yeah. And then chapter four and five are back to the memoir bits. And then chapter six is the observe practice, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it's laid out. I really love that. Yeah. So the book is equal parts memoir, but equal parts, practical teaching, practical tools for emotional resilience to help you get through this very challenging time. I love that. I want to mention the website before I forget. I wrote it down. Sharon Brock, mindfulness.com. Sharon Brock, mindfulness.com. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, And mindfulness has one L. Yeah. Yeah. I always have to check. I always have to check myself on that. Yeah. Um, no, it's very common. Yeah. There's also some online courses you offer. Can you expand on what that is? Sure. So I have an online course um, that accompanies the book. And so it's essentially six video sessions that go through each letter in great detail. And you know, for someone who wants more of an interactive experience to mm. really learn the Levy method at a deep level, more than the book, um, this online course is um, incredibly helpful. And I'm running a special, the course is 497, but I'm running this special to 197 during the book launch. 
until right. September 20th. Okay. And all that information is on my website, Sharon Brock Mindfulness. One L. <laughs> One L. <laughs> how do yeah. you, how did how, give us one example of your typical day, like you said, your first panic attack, right? Or mm. anxiety. How, what do you stop, drop and roll? What do you stop and do immediately when you feel that coming on? What's your go-to method for yeah. sort of centering yourself and bringing it down? That's, that's a great question because, you know, because I'm human, I still get triggered all the time, you know, as we all do. And well, let's say I get triggered with anxiety. And the, I call it the what if software, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if the worst case scenario. Right. And, um, I will, you know, remember fight or flight. It's like fight or flight. I'm, I flight. (laughs) And then I, I fight (laughs) and then I cuss a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So all I know is that when I fight, I usually regret what I've said. So I, I, I try to make a habit of excusing myself Yeah. and, um, taking some deep breaths. And then I go through lovey. Like I, I do lovey every single day, Mm -hmm. every day. And I go through and I'll just say, okay, anxiety is here. I label it. I observe it in my body as a sensation. Mm -hmm. So I'm no longer identifying with it. I'm not saying I am angry or I am anxious. I'm saying, okay, anger is rising here. I I observe it. And I recognize that I'm not alone in feeling this way. That's what the value is. Valuing Mm -hmm. your humanity. Embrace is a self-compassion practice. So I'm also certified to teach mindful self-compassion, which is uh, research backed from UC San Diego program. And so I embrace that little anxiety and say, it's okay, I got you. You know, I, I'll keep you safe. I'll keep you protected. You know, so I'm calming that energy because what you're doing with Levy is you're recognizing that emotions are energies in motion. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not necessarily who you are. You don't have to identify with them. They come and they go. They're just a natural part of he- being human. Kind of like sitting when you hear that, that phrase, um, like you need to sit in your feelings, right? You can't just yeah. stuff them. You can't stuff them. You have to you recognize. Like yeah. You recognize you're feeling mm-hmm. a certain type of way. Like yeah. you said, give it a label. Um, I'm like, yeah, that bitch is back. <laughs> But I mean, you know, like that's oh, you gotta me. embrace that little one. That's, yeah. that's me. That's how I. I'm like, oh, okay. She says it all nice and sweet. I'm like, nope. That bitch is uh-huh. back again. Anxiety. I, for instance, I had a CT scan recently, mm. and they found an enlarged lymph node. So just this morning, I was back at uh, my hospital at 6:45, getting an ultrasound on the lymph node, and I just got results 10 minutes before I logged on, and I was sitting here like, oh. Sh- I- you know, like all anxious, like I want to read that. And then I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to read that right now. But I have learned over the last nine years to recognize like, okay, I'm, I'm doing it again. I have said to Chris, I'm having this pain and I got some blood work back and my lymphocytes are high and this is that. And I was like, what if it's brain cancer? And he's like, come on, care. But she also just lifted like a large box and couldn't move a box that big. And there are a couple other factors in there. (laughs) Oh. I've learned to recognize it now rather than just yes. like get all anxious and then lash out at people or be rude. Or like you said, you regret something you say, or you just get yeah. sick. I have yeah. learned that I have to like, okay, I'm tripping. Let me take it down a notch. Right. And so I, that's why I, I love what you do. I can't wait to read this because you I love it. it. I love you. You love it up. I love that's it. what I say. <laughs> that's exactly what I say. Okay. So this is another way to think of it. Yeah. 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 So you want to think of lovey as a safe container that you input your anger or you input your anxiety or input your depression. And then you lovey it up. It's like a little machine. Boop, 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 boop. And then it comes out the other side as equanimity. And that's what the final E is. Okay. And I'll talk about that for a second. So equanimity means non-reactivity. You're able to handle things with grace calm, cool, collected, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not denied, you're not in denial, but you're not resisting the circumstance. You're not reacting, like overreacting, you're acknowledging it, you're giving it a spot. I'm thinking when you were describing putting it in that, I was thinking about a cuss jar. (laughs) (laughs) Swear jar? Swear jar, right? 
you know, like, okay, here oh, comes, that's how, that's how I'm going to remember it. So I'm going to think, okay, so if I start to feel anxious or I start to feel whatever, I can put that in my little cuss jar, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Sure. Handle yeah. it and then dump it out and go buy myself a coffee or something, right? I could have used this conversation before I started driving around this morning with my right? kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. people driving that's crazy. Right. I found it that's sounds- it. It sounds and, like this method is really, I mean, obviously it's fantastic for cancer patients, right? But it's really good for anyone who's experiencing any of these negative emotions. This book is yeah. not, would you say this book is just, I mean, I know the intention is to support breast cancer patients who are going through it, but would you say that it's good for any cancer type of patient? Really good for anyone yeah. Yeah. Who, who struggles with anxiety, anger, yeah. or depression. It really is. I think it's important because to say that because I don't want people to think, oh, this is just a breast cancer book. That's right. And so for someone who's not going through a health crisis, but they are, let's say, going through a divorce or going mm-hmm. through another incredible challenge in their life, and they're having these anger, anxiety, depression, emotions that are so intense, this book can also serve them. And you, you can think of it as I'm just teaching the lovey method, which is for emotional resilience, but through a story, yeah, right? I'm just making it a little more engaging because I'm teaching these practical mindfulness tools, you know, through storytelling. It's like getting the blueprints and then somebody to explain why everything's at a certain angle. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So it really is for anyone, but you know, I mean, first and foremost, my vision is to support women going through this, of course. Right. Um, but lovey itself, like I work with as a mindfulness coach, I, I have clients and, you know, they, they don't have a health concern. They're just there for, for emotional support. Yeah. I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Thank you for writing that. I think oh, you're going to help you. a lot of people. And we do have a library here at the care project. So I will order a, a copy to have here. And um, hey. patients are often referred to as right at the time of diagnosis, some mid, some mid treatment, yeah. some well into survivorship, but it sounds like this method is um, if we're talking just about breast cancer patients in this moment, it's also great for survivors because like yeah. my story, I just said, here I am nine years out and I'm still getting scans and I'm getting blood work and sure. annual stuff. And so that brings up a lot of stuff, anxiety and all the what ifs, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've had trauma, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. so it's for you, it, it actually did happen, mm-hmm. right? That, that what if actually happened, you did get that positive diagnosis, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, like things happen that are out of your control. Yeah. And, and that's, that's also a big part of um, the self-compassion work. Yeah. I wanted to touch I've on that. been trained in is like, this is the pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional mm-hmm. quote. You know, the pain is the bad things that happen in life. And we actually don't have control over that mm-hmm. as much as we think that, or that we want to think that we have control. We don't. And, you know, I'm a perfect example of that perfectly healthy, young, not in my family. And I got cancer. It's, it was completely out of the blue. And that happens to a lot of people. So that's the pain. So that's inevitable. You know, bad things happen. It just does. And so the suffering is optional in that we can learn how to not react so much to the pain, to the bad things. So it, the, I would say the biggest breakthrough that I had during my cancer journey. So like, if you don't get anything from the talk, this is the most important thing. It wasn't my cancer that caused me to suffer. It was my reaction to having cancer that caused me to suffer. Mm -hmm. And with mindfulness, I learned to reduce my reactivity. And so therefore I suffered less. Right. And that's that intersection of science meeting spirituality, right? Yes. Which is so, so important for us. We talk about it a lot on this show, all the complementary therapies and the myth that Western medicine and Eastern modalities, such as mindfulness practice, meditation, Reiki, all these other things that can complement your traditional chemo, radiation, all that, they can work hand in hand. A hundred percent. Right. One doesn't cancel out the other. No, absolutely not. And I, again, this was another, again, so many spoiler alerts for the book, but another, 
major breakthrough that I had was that because of my mindfulness practice, I had hardly any side effects from my chemo. Like I had bad side effects, like for chemos one, two, and three, but four, five, six, and beyond, I had hardly any. And I, well, I mean, I had some, but much greater reduced reduction in side effects. And I know it was because of my mindfulness. I was, I was not reactive. I was going into my chemo sessions, like it is what it is. This is what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Sales, are you ready? Let's welcome, let's welcome it in. We don't need to resist the chemo. And I, at least in my like firsthand experience opinion, I believe that I didn't have those side effects because my cells weren't resisting. Yeah. And you didn't, I, I what I'm thinking as you're speaking that is the, I was going back to when I was walking in chemo, I have the chills saying this when I was, would be walking into a treatment and um, no matter how much, like I said, I made it all an occasion, right? It, it was a theme. Like my nurses would be like, what hat is she wearing today? You know, or what shoes does she have on? Um, but it was still, no matter how much I tried to hype myself up, you know, with the music I chose on the way to the hospital or whatever. Yeah. The minute I hit that floor, the the, the fourth floor for oncology, the anticipation of how I was about to feel physically having experienced it before. Right. Um, that anticipatory anxiety that you don't even realize you're having has got to have an effect on how your body reacts. I have nothing to back that up other than my own experience, but I'm just thinking if I had the tools now, if I had to go through chemo now, I think I would have a very different experience. Yes, that's right. I think you've been training your mind. I think you've over the years since you were Mm -hmm. diagnosed, you've been um, dealing with it and quite well, honestly, Um, started a nonprofit, dealt with it that way. You are do your survivor socials, do it that way. You wrote a book, you started a podcast. Yeah, this is a, yeah, you doing it. <laughs> yeah, I guess it you is. turned wow. your pain into purpose. You did. I did. I did. Yeah. I I I share the story all, all the time. When I was diagnosed, while I did go into shock, I did have an what I call an uncanny piece about it, and I just felt like it was a responsibility given to me to show others how they could handle it. We all handle things differently. Right. There's no right or wrong way. I think what is essential, though, is what you've touched on: is that we have to acknowledge those feelings right? The good, the bad, the ugly. We have to acknowledge it. We have to find a way to manage it and then excuse it. Like pack your stuff and go people. Well, (laughs) all of that, all of that is the process, right? That is the lovey method. Essentially, it's a little bit different, but, but essentially when you say, and, and let that anger go with lovey, with the embrace practice, and this is all research-based rather than like pushing it out the door, you actually integrate it and it gets processed in the body. Mm-hmm. And essentially you take the role of like the compassionate parent taking care of that little angry child. So that's a kind of the energetics of it. And okay. that's a good analogy. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Yeah. And it yeah. just kind of integrates because anger is just emotion, energy, right? So or, instead of okay. taking that child, that's lost their mind temporarily and banishing them to a corner, you grab them and you embrace them and you yes, got it. Ooh, I got, I got the chills. You got it. I got it. I'm going to go order the book right now. One for me. Oh, Oh, I'm so glad. No, I mean, there's so much more we could talk about, but we got to go. So we just want to thank you, Sharon. Again, it's Sharon Brock. Um, The book is called the lovey method L O V E E. Five Mindfulness Practices for the Journey of Breast Cancer, which you can find on SharonBrockMindfulness.com, 1L in mindfulness. <laughs> you sound like a professional, Carrie. How long have you been doing this? I don't know. I think it's been a year. Jeez. Another great book you can pick up is my book called Handle with Care. Breast Cancer. No, what is it called? Handle with Care or your support group in a book. That's what it is. Jeez, I had to think about it. So what this book is, what our book is, and you can find it on the careprojectinc.org is um, 12 of us survivors got together and uh, led by Margaret Lesh, who's an accomplished author and two-time survivor. So she's got a ton of experience. And she asked us our perspective on various aspects of treatment. So how do we deal with chemo, losing our hair? How do we talk to our kids? what not to say, what is helpful to say. Um, and so it's a great handbook, um, much like yours. I think it's, it's something that it sounds like with your book, I don't have it in front of me yet. 
you can pick it up and go to a chapter that is yeah. specific to what you're enduring at that moment. And you- 100%. Okay. And, and as well as put in your earbuds and listen to the meditations. Yeah. I really love that thought. Cause when I think about all the hours I spent in chemotherapy, just sitting there looking at everyone around me, who, in my opinion, I didn't look like them. I did, right. but I didn't, you know, in my mind, I was like, yeah. I don't look like that. Do I? And my mom would look at me like, well, <laughs> you know, but if I had had something useful and relevant to listen to, you know, that would have been fantastic. So I thank you so much for joining us. Chris, you got anything else for her? Uh, no, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I think I'm going to use this practice tomorrow or later today. <laughs> I, I really, I think that the steps you have are, are very practical and easy to understand. So um, yeah, I'm going to try it. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I think it's really important that it is practical because we're yeah. already, we're already, whether you're an anxious person or you're dealing with some trauma or craziness that you're going through a divorce, whatever that is, or if it's cancer, you're already processing so much complicated crap right? Yeah. You need yeah. easy to remember practical tools and, and steps that you can do anywhere. And it sounds like this is it. This is it. This is Thank it. you, Gary. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon. You take you care. Too. Take care. Thank you for listening to Handle with Care, Cancer and Beyond. Please let us know what you think of the show by leaving a rating and review. And don't forget to share it with a friend. For more information or to connect with Carrie, go to thecareprojectinc.org.